This is the upper loom. The, towards the end of September now, and the trout fishing season is almost over. Soon, brown trout will be spawning in the river here, and we will no longer be fishing for them. Everything is autumnal. The meadows either side of the river are quiet. There are no lapwings, no curlews that were here in spring and summer. They're now on the coast. So too are the oyster catchers. They used to pipe and nest on the shingle here. The common sandpiper they used to teeter down the bank on the other side. That's back in Africa. And soon the trees will be bare. And it'll all be over for another year. Well, I've come here just to finish off the trout fishing season with a dry fly. What we'll do is just uh, tie one of these duns on. Uh, there are duns coming off, and so this is the little cooler canard dun, which is an absolutely killing dry fly when the fish are taking duns and small sedges. And the, fly, the, the, the tying I use is a tuck blood knot, and it's an easy one to tie. I've tied this since I was a boy, so I just go around the, the line four times, and then back through, and then back through that, that other loop so that it's tucked through two loops. Always let the lead before you tighten it up. Tighten up, and then get your snippers and snip off. Interestingly, notice how everything's to hand. A lot of people you'll see with fishing waistcoats and so on, fishing vests the Americans call them. I don't, I wear this necklace. Old Hugh Falkers, who's dead now, the famous sea trout salmon angler, thought I looked like a red Indian wearing this, and then he saw the sense of it. You see, there's my dry flies. There's a pair of artery forceps. There's my floatant. There's my snippers. And when I want to look at an insect, there's my hand lens. Everything's to hand. I don't need anything else. And I can fit other things on if I want to onto these clips. Wonderful invention. And I was grateful for John Woods when he gave it me. Wonderful. When I started fly fishing, I used to get little bits of leader material, nylon, of different thicknesses and knot them together. A uh, great problem then, of course, is that if you do a, a slightly off cast, the knots catch the line and you finish off with a tangle. When I was a boy, I used to get tangles more than not. If you see what I mean, that's a pun. Uh, now I use these tapered leaders. Uh, when, we're, when we're nymph fishing, I use some braided ones, but this is the best, I think. This is a hardy copolymer tapered leader, and it tapers from a thick butt there, which is loop to loop to my nylon, my fly line. So there's the copolymer leader, and it tapers down at this end to a three pound point, to which I've tied on my fly. If uh, this gets short, these are quite expensive, but this gets shorter, then I, I tie on using a, a four turn water knot, a point. And if I want to use a, a smaller fly than that, where a three pound point is too thick, then I will knot on, say, a two or one and a half pound point onto the end of the use of four turn water knot. And so that is a wonderful turnover. They're the best leaders, and you can alter the end to suit the fly you're tying. A few moments ago, I thought I heard a trout rise under there. What I'm going to do is to wait, see exactly where it is, and because the first of the autumn duns are hatching, I'm going to put a large olive pattern on and see if I can take this fish. It's futile to cast in hope. Cast accurately where the fish has risen and you'll catch it, or should do. So what we're going to do is to wait and watch and be patient. There it's risen. Now I know exactly where it is. It's under the branch there. And what I'm going to do is to use my third leg to get into the position. Now, this river is extremely slippery on the bottom. The boulders are covered in algae. And if I didn't have my third leg, this wading staff, then I would be making all sorts of splashing sounds. But because I've got my third leg, I don't wallow around in the water. I can get slowly into position. There's, that's where the fish is. We saw it exactly. Now it's going to be an awkward position because we're going to have drag. It's on the other side under those bushes, so I'm going to get a little bit further across, well below it. Now the river here is very clear. And if I tried to approach from upstream, the fish would see me and leave. These are wild fish. One very common uh, river animal 
uh, it, especially where you've got a fair bit of limestone, is the freshwater shrimp, sometimes called gamorous. Its scientific name is gamorous. This is a shrimp, and in fact, this freshwater shrimp is in fact uh, evolved from uh, a marine shrimp. So it's invaded freshwater in the last few thousand years. Uh, this is a typical adult. Notice it's sort of pale grey. So the grey shrimp imitates it quite well. But notice one other point, and that is that there's a little orange spot on this body, of the body of this animal there. That orange spot is, is, is caused by a parasite. Uh, the parasite results in that orange spot. And you will notice that in a lot of flies that we fish, um, we put a little bit of orange in. Now the orange is not really to imitate that. The orange is because fish respond well to orange in slightly coloured water. So that's gamorous, the freshwater shrimp. Um, I rate an imitation gamorous as good as any general bug for general fishing. Fish love shrimps. One interesting thing is if you catch a trout or a grayling that's been eating, on shri eating shrimps, when you spoon it and look at the, com the contents of its stomach, you'll find that the shrimps are orange, rather like the, the, pickle sh the shrimps that we eat that have been boiled from the sea. Just one quickie, notice the size. That would be a size 18, perhaps a 16. The biggest, that is a quite a largish one. It's a good centimetre long, but with the curve, it's probably about a size 12 or 14 hook. Here we've got two of the most important uh, insects uh, in rough, rocky streams. They're two caddis flies. Now, caddis flies normally have casey, but these are two caseless caddis. This one's called Hydropsyche. This one's called Ryacophila. And they are similar, but different. Ryacophila is usually some shade of green. Notice the very soft green and brown body. And notice at the end, you've got two little tails, which end in hooks. This crawls around among stones, amongst moss, and is highly carnivorous. And uh, it's got quite powerful jaws on the head, and it will take nymphs, uh, Echdianuris nymphs, Baetis nymphs, other caddis flies, to that size, it'll even eat trout eggs. Now that is quite a reasonable size one. It's about a centimetre and a half long, equivalent perhaps to a size 12, perhaps 14 hook. Now this one is Hydropsyche. Hydropsyche, you notice, doesn't crawl very well and it's an awful swimmer. That normally lives underneath a little net that it spins for itself in which it traps its food. It too is carnivorous, but notice it's a sort of brown colour very rarely is this green, and very rarely is Rycophila uh, brown like this. But the real diagnostic character is to look at the two tails. In Hydropsyche, the end in two little fan-shaped sets of gills. Whereas in Rycophila, the end in hooks. So there's Hydropsyche, there's Rycophila. These will hatch uh, in caddis flies uh, sometime May through till September, October. This one is known as the sand fly, it's a little sandy brown coloured fly, occurs in vast shoals that uh, flocks under the trees on summer evenings. This one, the fly, the adult fly is usually a grey colour, uh, often called a grey flag or grey sedge, sometimes a silver sedge. Uh, it's one of the grey caddis flies, so they're quite different when they're adult flies as well. Both of them important trout foods as both the larvae and as the adult. We've seen Hydropsyche and Ryacophila, two caseless caddis, uh, one of them Rycophila free living and one of them Hydropsyche that lives in little nets that it spins itself, rather like a spider. These are cased caddis, caddis that the larva has a little case, in this case of sand, uh, to protect it from marauding trout and grayling. Some people do go on about the fact you can identify uh, cased caddis to species according to the case. To some extent you can, but you've got to be careful because whatever is available for the caddis to make its case with depends on what the case is made of, so do be careful. Now I've collected some and put them in a little bowl so you can see what they're up to. You'll see them crawling around, the, the black legs stick out of the front, the black head. Um, many of our bugs, basic bugs, things like a herzia gold head is a, a callus, a case callus imitation, a very good one. Um, but often in a flood these may get washed out. And what I'll do is I'll take the big fellow out of his case. When I put him back in the river later on, you'll see he'll build a new one. But I'll take him out of his case, and then uh, you can see what he looks like if he'd been washed out. Pull him out, and you'll see 
that these things have hooks on the bodies that hold them in the case. They're very difficult to pull out, but he'll, he'll leave loose in a minute. Here he comes. Here he comes. Now, the pale bug that we can tie imitates him. Notice that we use, say, a hare's ear, thorax head, that's matched by that, and then we've got a pale body. And they come in all sorts of colours, so you could do cream to match this one, or a yellowish, or pale olive. All these abdomens you could use, and then a hare's ear, or even a peacock curl thorax head, and there you matched uh, a carriage that's been washed out of its case, or lost its case in a flood. Right, so here are some caddis, some case caddis. Here we've got the one I took out of its case, meandering across the bottom. When I put him in, he'll make himself a new case. Uh, but notice the sort of cream body, the dark thorax and head, dark legs, the sort of thing we Im imitate with a whole variety of bugs. All insects grow through molting, and they molt their outer case uh, as they grow. Now, this is a biotis out, has molted out, and there's left the old shuck behind. So that's the dead skin. It's rather like a little schoolboy having to have a new blazer bought him. Well, that's the old blazer, and the new one is a couple of sizes bigger, and now the biotis is growing into the new one. And it keeps molting, molting and molting and molting and growing and growing and growing until eventually it reaches the stage where it's got black wing buds and it's getting ready to hatch. And the next molt will be the hatch into the dome. This is one which I've just got out of the bowl. And can you see the wing buds are quite black? Now that might hatch this afternoon into the large dark olive dome. That is ready for hatching. That has spent a year as a nymph in the river and now it's going to hatch as a tiny mayfly called the large dark olive. Um, one very important nymph in still waters, especially reedy still waters, are the damselfly nymphs. So this is a damselfly nymph which is one year old. Next year that will probably be two to three times as big and hatch out. And you might have noticed how it uses its abdomen to swim. Notice it's got three flat tails at the end of its abdomen. Those are gills, three pairs of legs, quite a large head and a long tapering body.